recording going. And I'll just begin by introducing our, our first speaker. And once again, thank you everyone for coming together and joining online during this really intense uh, and uncertain time. And one of the topics that really came to mind as being a particularly important topic right now is the topic of science and science communication. And we immediately thought of our member, Zach Bailey, and asked if he'd be interested in sharing some of his ideas um, around coronavirus. And so he agreed, and we have, his, we have him as a presenter today. And I want to read you a short bio so you have a sense of Zachary's background. Zachary is originally from Washington State, and he graduated from Washington State University in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in zoology. He first came to Europe to do an internship at the Seckenberg Research Institute in Frankfurt am Main, Germany. He then took part in the Erasmus Mundus double degree master's program. Through this, he graduated from the University of Montpellier and Ludwig Maximilians University with master's degrees in evolutionary biology. He is now studying as a doctoral student at ETH, the ETH, however you pronounce it, in Zurich. Some people say ETH, they use the German, and some people say ETH, but I think Zurich people know what I'm talking about. He works on antibiotic resistance and the evolution and ecology of bacteriophage, bacteriophage, um, the viruses that uh, infect and eat bacteria. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Zachary. Hello, uh, let me, oh, so you actually have to enable my screen sharing for sure, yeah. And Zach, do I do that? Um, is that on my main? Is mm -hmm. I do I manage participants? Mm -hmm. Okay. How is that? That that works. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So today, uh, as Darcy said, we're going to talk about science communication and some of the trusted sources uh, that exist during this time of, of COVID-2019. Um, but uh, first I'm gonna go around some, some background on, on the outbreak, just a very, very short kind of thing. Uh, talk about some of the things that are uh, scientifically interesting to me. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some kind of the state of scientific communication, the, the things uh, like, like so many things during this outbreak, um, this isn't something that's new. Uh, having erroneous uh, facts being spread is something that's been with us before and it's gonna be with us afterwards. So I'm gonna kind of go into a little bit about how that occurs. Um, and I'm also gonna give um, what describe what makes a really good source for scientific information during this time, uh, and give just, a, just a, a few examples of that as well. So uh, first things first, um, their name actually of, of the virus uh, is, is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is decided by this like international committee on the taxonomy for viruses. Uh, they're the ones that come up with the names um, and they did it within one day of the, the World Health Organization uh, deciding on the name uh, COVID-19 for the disease. Uh, these are like separate things, much like uh, how HIV is, is the causative agent of, of AIDS. So. Yeah, there's, there's that. So SARS-CoV-2 stands for uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Uh, it's a really terrible name because the name would like make you think that it causes SARS, um, but it does not. It causes COVID-19. Um, a little bit better name that was actually uh, put forth by uh, this group of Chinese scientists is the, the Human Coronavirus 2019, 
which would make a lot more sense, but uh, it's this international committee which gets to decide. So we scrap that. And during the time of this entire presentation, I'm just going to call the virus uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and the disease COVID-2019. Uh, so it's you know a completely novel coronavirus, at least to humans. Uh, we did a little bit more on that in uh, just a sec. Uh, and of course, as we know, it, it's spread by respiratory droplets and, and, and fomites, which is the, the scientific term for literally any surface. So uh, that's kind of how it gets around. And of course, right here on this is this uh, picture um, of uh, artistic representation, actually, of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, with all the little uh, spike proteins in red that actually uh, attach. Uh, so a little bit about the potential origins of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is something that came up and something that's uh, debated uh, for some reason. Um, so here is actually a figure from a paper that was published this year, um, of course. And at the very top is this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus's genome and the layout of it. Um, and then in these two, two there's um, coronaviruses that exist in pangolins. Um, these nice scaled uh, mammals and bats, of course. Um, and it kind of shows, um, well, the, there's a lot of numbers, of course, in here from this nice scientific publication. But for my purposes, I'm really just focused on, on these two little red numbers here, which show that there's over a 90% similarity between the coronavirus, which infects us, and these coronaviruses that we find in pangolins and bats. So, while we don't actually know, like neither of these seem to be a good candidate for the exact virus that actually came over from, a, from an animal source into humans, uh, we, we know that for sure that this is not a man-made virus. It probably came from either a pangolin or a bat. Um, there's you know, some discussion about this because the, the wet market, which we believe in Wuhan that this first came out, uh, doesn't actually sell bats. Uh, but they do sell, you know, everything else under the sun, and uh, bats are well known to to spread their viruses to all kinds of different mammal intermediaries uh, before they reach humans. So that was the case for the original uh, SARS virus, for example. Um, and here is something that kind of in, has been interesting me when it comes to this uh, is this idea of genomic epidemiology. So, so, you know, uh, every one of these viruses, you know, has its own genome, its own genetic code, which is trying to spread uh, by infecting new hosts. And, and a good way that to, to think of um, this idea of genomic epidemiology is if, if you have this genetic code being like a, a passport, basically. And every time there's a mutation in the passport, uh, you have uh, a new stamp in it, basically. And, and as the virus goes to new countries, it collects new stamps but you know where it's been because those stamps are still there. So, so you get to see where it's been before based on the mutations that it's accumulated over time. Uh, this giant cluster of, of uh, colored dots is uh, individual coronavirus genomes that have been collected uh, by this group uh, at this website, Next Strain. Uh, there's this huge consortium of scientists that have collected thousands and thousands of genomes of coronaviruses uh, from different uh, patients. Um, and here on right is, is a map of, of where uh, each of those have been collected and all these uh, lines in between show the, the spread of the virus and, and there's now, you know, been a completely global phenomenon. Um, a, a good example where this has actually affected public policy is actually in, in my home state, in Washington state, they were able to, to sequence someone, a teenager who was infected with the coronavirus uh, very early on and they noticed that, that um, that coronavirus that he had was very similar to a patient that had come from China um, just a couple, a few weeks before. And knowing that, they knew that this coronavirus had been spreading completely undetected in Washington state for, for several weeks uh, for that time. And we knew then that the scope of the crisis was very severe. Uh, and this was, you know, all the way back in March, of course. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something that's both very interesting and has a very uh, good like practical application for how we treat uh, these kinds of diseases. Um, so another thing that's interesting to me is modeling the outbreak. Uh, I do a little bit of uh, mathematical modeling in, in what I do. 
Uh, this is a group uh, within Switzerland that actually uh, has all these modeling estimates for the outbreak uh, in Europe. Uh, this one specifically is uh, an output that they had for Switzerland. And you've probably heard a lot about this, this uh, R not, this, this, this uh, term gets, you know, was thrown around, especially I know in March, I, I heard it uh, you know, a million, million times, oh, we have to get the R not. Um, and that's just the basic reproduction number, uh, which is um, just other than the number of people that, that uh, it represents uh, is unitless. So it just says like over the course of one person that's infected, they infect two people or three people or four people on average. And you can see for, for the Switzerland outbreak, uh, their kind of initial R not here uh, back in February was, was somewhere between three and four. Uh, this has a really large confidence interval. Uh, but they show that after doing certain interventions, you can see um, the number of people that uh, are infected on average declining all the way until it gets below one, uh, which is very, very good for us. This, is, this actually shows a, a very good thing for us because as long as the reproductive number is below one, that means that the um, epidemic here, at least, is going to die out because uh, it's not propagating enough to spread. So, uh, this is another fun graph, um, uh, also involving modeling. Uh, this one uh, is from the Imperial College of London. Uh, this one has you know, many, many colors in it. Uh, and this one is, is modeling the outbreak in the United States uh, here in gray. Yeah, so here in these little gray dots, all the dots are actual data that they've collected up to this point. So all these gray dots are actual cases, uh, these kind of purplish dots, that's actually the number of, of deaths that have occurred uh, cumulatively in the United States. And this is on a, a logarithmic scale is what it's called. So, um, you know, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, it goes, you know, one to a hundred to 10,000 to a million. So small increases are actually quite a lot um, of number of people. So it's just something to, to keep in mind. Um, and, and here, this, this purple line here is actually the estimated number of deaths. And, and this was a model where they took into um, account that there would be social distancing and even a lockdown occurring to really reduce the number of infections that happen. But uh, this grew, this lab actually uh, produced a model. They said, well, okay, what if there was no lockdown? What if there was no social distancing? What is the worst possible scenario for the United States? And, and they said that could be over 2 million uh, people dying in the United States. And, and this kind of study uh, coming out um, actually really helped our country uh, really change course in, in how we viewed the severity of the outbreak, that there could be something of, of really immense, immense um, and, and historical proportions, um, at least, for the moment, even, even Donald Trump was convinced for at least half a second that coronavirus was something to be taken seriously. Um, so I'm going to go now kind of switch gears towards the actual uh, state of scientific communication. Um, the first thing is that just there's, there's a lot of information to communicate. Um, even just during this last few months, um, there have been now thousands of papers on the coronavirus. And, and it's very important to collect all this and to be able to spread really important results in a clear and concise manner that's, that's generally understandable. Because even scientists in, in very closely related fields uh, sometimes don't get to fully understand each other just because of how uh, specialized people are nowadays, especially. Um, and you know, every person, you know, you can't know every subject uh, just as, as much as you can. So it's really important to, to spread this in a way that's very understandable. And one thing that often happens is that both on the science side, you know, scientists fail to communicate well with the public. I know, you know, looking around at my colleagues, we're a bunch of um, extremely introverted people oftentimes. Uh, a lot of things that make you uh, an, an excellent, excellent uh, scientist don't always make you the best orator and uh, you know, public person. Um, and also on the other side, uh, journalists sometimes fail to really accurately report on the science itself. Um, and, and I'll get more into that uh, in, in a moment here. Um, and then lastly, you know, on top of the, our normal human foibles where you know, we just don't say the right thing in the right way, 
Um, there's many, many people out there that are also actively working to spread false information uh, about science. Um, and, and because of this and because of everything that's going on, we certainly need to have um, effective science communication uh, now more than, than ever, really. So here's a couple of headlines from, from the New York Times. Uh, when I think of science communication and the importance uh, of spreading uh, accurate facts and kind of the, the things that I have to go up against uh, in this realm, these are, these are the two things that really stick out to me, both, both uh, vaccine and, and climate denial um, are two really big things that have been around with us even before. And they're two things that, are, um, that Donald Trump um, goes against as well. Uh, it says here, uh, this was after the Republican debate where, where um, Donald Trump decided to say that, oh, well, you know, you don't need to have all your shots and you don't need them all, you know, right at once. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And these are the kinds of things that, that really have the real world consequences where we had a, you know, a really large scale measles outbreak even bef before this. That was quite devastating. Um, and, I, and I can only uh, fear that even at a point when we do get a vaccine in the United States, what people might think and do uh, based upon all this built-in vaccine hesitancy and denial. Um, and then something else that's always brewing in the background um, is, is climate change for sure. Um, and of course now um, there's plenty of more new, new things that always come out. So um, it's very important because even as at the very highest levels of government, we have people that are actively spreading to do very terrible, wrong, and incorrect things when it comes to the use of disinfectants, for example, um, or when it comes to just taking drugs um, haphazardly without any uh, really concrete evidence that they work effectively. Uh, it can be very devastating. Um, so to give kind of a, a little bit more lighthearted um, case study uh, on how this kind of goes down, um, there's this guy, uh, John Bohannon, who um, did this purposeful sting basically to show how uh, a scientific study could be sort of both manipulated and then expounded out into, into the media in a very incorrect form or rather uh, how really junk science can be, can be published and spread. So a little bit about the, the study that he did is he just um, put out an ad to uh, people in the Frankfurt uh, online area um, saying like, hey, you wanna do a dietary study? He got about 18 participants or so uh, and just had them eat a small bar of, of really dark bitter chocolate uh, for a few weeks. Um, and during the course of the study, they did, you know, like uh, blood samples and, 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 you know, had them people measure their weight. Um, and, and they did divide it into at least two groups. So that was already, you know, I mean, something, I guess. <laughs> but um, he didn't really take any precautions to uh, intentionally to like have um, a large number of, of participants or trying to divide them equally, having an equal number of, of, of male and female participants, for example. Uh, and at the end, after taking a lot of measurements of all these people, they said, oh, well, look, you know, um, chocolate helps you lose weight. Good to go. Uh, so he did, published up, he um, made uh, this nice headline um, in, in a lot of different places uh, that, that, oh, chocolate helps you lose weight. Um, and he was able to do that because uh, when he actually published the study, he, he published to a lot of these pay to play journals all at once. He said he published to 20 different journals all at the same time, which is a very big no-no for, for, for real scientists, uh, which, which this guy actually does have a PhD in microbiology, of course. So it, this is a diet study, which is nothing to do with microbiology, but, but he, he doesn't know how this thing actually goes down. Uh, and so intentionally he did this. He, he submitted to all these, uh, what we call predatory journals, oftentimes in the science world, because they'll offer to uh, publish whatever you want basically for a fee uh, and oftentimes they have names that uh, sound even sometimes like like real journals as well it's it's, uh, it's a very bad practice and then they're kind of a, a pox on the whole uh, scientific community um so first he submitted to a whole bunch of places and, and when he actually got uh, something published 
He said they didn't even change a single word. The, the, the journal supposedly said they have a, a rigorous peer review process that they actually um, would go through and, and actually um, check the science, but that they didn't change a single word of what he submitted. Um, and because of that, uh, he then created a, uh, a press release, um, which had all the, all the words and, and all the right phrasing to go directly into some kind of uh, news piece, like Puff news piece like this from, from the Huffington Post here, but from there's a lot of different places. Uh, so people actually just copied his press release verbatim. They didn't, they didn't do, bother to do any fact checking, like Googling the, the supposed uh, research institute that he was a part of, which was fake and very clearly fake, uh, Googling himself uh, to find out that he, he is not a, a, someone who actually works in human diet science. Um, so in, through the whole process, nobody really questioned how he did this study. Um, which, which is just kind of this compounding factor to show that when you have um, journals that, that have these really unscrupulous practice, when you, have, when you have journalists that don't bother to do a simple Google search uh, to find out if something's real before publishing it, um, and then nobody from the media then even really questioning, he said even when he got questions from people, it had nothing to do with his sample size, which was clearly very small and skewed, or the way he did his study, um, he did this thing called, what we call p-hacking. So in order to get something that's statistically significant, you just measure many, many things. So he didn't just measure uh, weight loss when, when it comes to chocolate, he, he measured uh, everything. Uh, how well you sleep, uh, how, how well you, you know, woke up in the morning, uh, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, you know, and if it wasn't weight loss, uh, he probably would have gotten something else to be statistically significant. Um, and the statistical significance could be, I mean, not really biologically significant because, uh, for example, uh, many people have fluctuations of their weight even naturally over this kind of period of time. So keeping everything on balance in a very small number of people, you can't really say anything from the results he got. But nobody ever questioned this, so it was able to, to spread. And, and this kind of thing is something that does happen uh, all the time. Um, even unintentionally, in this case, very intentionally, and he, you know, ex exposed all this after, after the fact to try to get people to to wisen up to the practices that they have. Uh, so, uh, following that, I'd want to talk about really what what makes a good source of scientific information. If you're reading something in, in the New York Times or the Huffington Post or or something that your you know crazy uncle forwards you on Facebook, how do I know that the science behind it is actually sound? Um, and so the first question I always ask, you know, first of all, is it, is it a news article? And if it's a news article, then um, is it actually citing the scientific sources that it, that it claims to have? If they're trying to show that there's some kind of result, can you actually go back to the original study that they're talking about? Because if, if you can't go back to some original study at all, if they're not actually citing any experts in the field, then I just kind of throw that out directly into the trash because they clearly don't actually want to publish something that's worthwhile to read. Um, and then if they actually, you know, are citing a, a scientific journal article, you know, if, if, if it's something, you know, if it's something in physics where I know less than nothing, probably, <laughs> um, how can I actually know that it's something that's trustworthy? Um, and the first kind of uh, test is if it's, is, is if it's something from something that's peer reviewed, so if, if you know it's from, uh, you can always actually Google this as well or, or look, go into the journal's website and, and see if they actually do a, a peer review process. Um, and also another important thing, uh, when it comes to like climate science and this vaccine science thing, there are people that, that you know, they, they publish things even sometimes in good faith, but, or, or diet science even is another big one. They publish things in good faith, but they might be funded by the oil industry or you know like you know you read something about how great breakfast cereals are for you to like you know start out the day and then you know it, it's funded by Kellogg cereals and you're like well maybe that's not something that's entirely trustworthy um and, and next is just is the journal itself reliable um here i have, I have a link people have, have uh, accumulated uh, basically where uh, this aggregate website kind of of, of all these different predatory journals that exist uh, and this is something you could you could just basically 
match it to see if, if the, predator, the journal that you're reading from is one of these predatory journals, then it's one that's, that's probably uh, not very reliable. Um, I, I have the benefit, um, and, and most academics have the benefit, that there's this database here called Ulrich's Web, uh, which, which allows you to directly search any journal, and then you know immediately if the journal is refereed or is it a, they're peer reviewing in the journal, and if the journal is reliable, because it'll tell you that it's um, not a predatory journal. Um, but for other purposes, when I, when I don't have access to a nice database like this, uh, things like this, there's some, there are some scientists that are really trying to um, spread good information to know how to, uh, to find good things. So uh, just a, a small handful of, of examples uh, that, I, that I trust. Uh, of course, the New York Times, I mean, so many people here probably read or have subscriptions to the New York Times, but I want to give them a double shout out because uh, they have had a science section for a really long time and they actually make a good commitment to science reporting. Uh, so much of print newspapers, or well, are now online mostly, uh, don't really make the same level of commitment to have good quality and thorough checking when it comes to their science reporting. And that's usually what, what where a lot of these uh, problems creep up. Uh, as I mentioned before with the case study, nobody was able to even do a Google search uh, of the people's names. And, and they'll at least do that uh, in the New York Times and a lot more usually. Um, so also there's these two major uh, journals uh, within the, the scientific realm for, for biologists being able to publish in Nature and Science is, is you know, a really big deal. And they have a, a new section actually that's, that's part of each of their journals. And it's very good, uh, just quality scientific reporting uh, on actual science news. Um, and they're both free as well, uh, which, is, which is also very important, um, especially now. Um, they've also given free access to any of their actual journal articles as well that have to do with, with the COVID-19 outbreak. So they have open access to that. So if there was something that you were in, interested in reading further about or, or trying to understand better, uh, they, they offer both of those things. Um, and it's, I mean, this is one of my favorite mediums for listening things. You know, I'm, I'm someone who, who uh, usually in normal times, I'm working in a lab. So it's good to have something to listen to while I'm you know, pipetting things. Uh, this is a very um, accessible podcast about um, science communication. They've done a really great series on coronavirus uh, called Science Versus, uh, and, and the, the host does a very good job of really breaking science down in, in a way that, that I, I think um, everybody can understand. Uh, another good one, I know a lot of people are, are familiar with the Crooked Network of podcasts uh, here, um, and this is a really good one as well. I have to, you know, really commend um, Abdul al said uh, for, for the work he's done for during a, in a America Dissected uh, because they've had a really great coronavirus series and then also even before they had some really great reporting on public health and the state of public health in the United States. Um, and, and lastly, this is one that's um, it's a lot more niche. Uh, there's a whole series of these like this week in parasitology, this week in microbiology, uh, but this week in virology is run by actual virologists. So this is very much like by scientists, for scientists. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, intense, but it, it is a very interesting source still. And, and some of their episodes, especially some segments of their episodes mostly, are, are just uh, a little bit more broadly, um, were projected towards a more broad audience. And, and they have some very interesting things to say as well. The guy who runs it uh, is a professor at, at Columbia University, uh, and, and he's very, very smart. Uh, and, and last, I'd like to leave you with, with uh, these are three books uh, that I think uh, really tackle this problem, um, especially this, this one I, I really, really love. This one both uh, made my blood boil <laughs> at a lot of different parts, um, but it talks a lot about the especially conservative campaign to, to kind of wage war uh, on, on scientific inquiry in, in the United States particularly, but um, also some things that are, that are global as well. Um, and and it, it's, uh, he also talks about this, this story of, of the guy with the, the chocolate study, but about so many other things as well, where there's this active disinformation campaign. Um, and these are two also um, good ones. Um, I'm someone who has a, a big background in, in evolutionary biology as well. And of course, it, um, this is a, a good read that also <laughs> makes me very angry, but also um, 
is good, good information. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your attention on that. If, if you have any questions or want to talk about anything regarding this, um, I would love to. Thank you, Zach. That is really helpful. And at the beginning of the presentation, Zach said that he could make those um, his present the PowerPoint presentation available to us. So we mm. will send that information out to people. So you've got all of those great resources. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions now. Um, who would like to? Who would? Who has a question for Zach? Who would like to begin? Yeah, you can just uh, start uh, unmute yourself and start talking. It's fine. So Zach, Hi, Zach, Chris. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I was just wondering. Um, you were saying that you um, take a look at Nature and Science Mag, and then New York Times. Um, do you find um, anything, or are you looking at any of the um, European? um things are there anything partic particular to switzerland or germany or anything coming out that um mm -hmm. your german language colleagues uh rely on yeah so i mean uh it depends what um what it is uh the kind of funny thing is that the the anglosphere has kind of taken over the science world so, mm -hmm. so really when it comes to these things, it, it's, it's really um, all these English language things that, that oftentimes they follow. Uh, but there are, I mean, of course, the, the governmental organizations here are actually, you know, they're very reliable and, and listening to like the Beage, Beage sorry, mm -hmm. um, and stuff is, is also um, very informative when it comes to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really when it comes to okay. resources, uh, in just that are very science specific. Uh, oftentimes, English ones kind of come out for an, for an audience. So, mm -hmm. But I, I would definitely be happy, uh, along with sending uh, the PowerPoint, to, to ask some of my uh, colleagues if, if they'd have a specific suggestion in this. Um, one of the things my, my German colleagues actually um, mentioned for them uh, was Twitter as a good source. Which I kind of laugh at, but but it's only true that if you're uh, like this, like my supervisor, you've been in science for a long time, you know a lot of these scientists personally, you know a lot of virologists personally, so you know, hey, if, if if I listen to what Richard Lenski has to say about something, then I'm going to trust it because I know he's a very smart person who does work in this field. So, so there's there's definitely uh, that that kind of thing as well. Um, th there are some of these people like, like Dr. Fauci and others who are public health officials who, who are really trying to, to spread good information in, in this way. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thanks. I want to thank our, I want to thank our presenter, but I also want to ask our host if she could close this, the, the, the sharing of the screen content so that we can see each other again. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good for the discussion. I find it more comfortable if we can all see each other again. Mm. I have I have a question if I can just in, in just use my airtime now, which is sort of indirectly connected to what you just presented, Zachary. It's it's about the way things are presented here in Switzerland right now. And I think we're all living here and maybe we all check in with local media as well. And I'm very concerned that even though, as you said, uh, the virus has, has very low uh, ratings right now, it's that we're, that we're in good shape here in Switzerland, I'm concerned that now that things have been loosened up, that people are becoming more active and more interconnected with each other mm -hmm. and not getting all the information that maybe some of us are getting when we look at the, the reports from the states where we're seeing intensive care and we're seeing patients who are suffering on the uh, on the American, at least on, on the visual media, I'm, I'm particularly talking about CNN International, I'm getting a lot of, uh, I'm getting inundated with information about the suffering that is connected with this virus. And here we don't get any of that. We get data, we get statistics, we get good information, we get advice, but people don't seem to know anybody or see anybody who has suffered. 
And I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on that. It's a, it's a concern that I have because I have a feeling that, that people are not really taking this seriously enough now that things have loosened up. And I'd appreciate your, your comment about that. Yeah, well, so yeah, that's, that's definitely the case that uh, as, as things worsen, uh, it's, it's always like, oh, well, what does the public health officials say? How do we, how do we make, handle this problem? Then as soon as things get under control again, then it's, oh, well, clearly, you know, this isn't a problem. So why, why are we listening to these health, public health officials? Let's just do this. Um, and, and that's definitely the case, uh, and especially other countries. Um, um, I, Brazil uh, would be, be one that, I, that I've followed a bit uh, where they've kind of used the, the evidence that, that social distancing and stuff works as evidence that, oh, there's not actually a problem. Coronavirus isn't really a, a big difficulty. Um, yeah, it, it, it's hard to say um, because people definitely are not, when they're not directly affected by it, you definitely uh, don't have the same degree of, of um, fear uh, about this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, no, um, it's gonna be interesting as we go forward and, and go under this, uh, out of lockdown, how people interact, um, mm -hmm. and, and the hope is that that people uh, act in a very um, the Swiss way of, of following uh, what <laughs> the government has to say in terms of uh, both social distancing practices and everything else. Yeah. Well, just to pick up on that, what the government isn't saying right now is a clear message about using masks or not. Uh, Hmm. And that's something that seems to be, do be done very much on an individual basis, which is very con disconcerting. Hmm. Those of us who believe in the masks and those who don't believe in the masks yeah. think that the other ones are idiots, you know? And instead of yeah. having a <laughs> guideline on that, uh, which so many other countries or, 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 or regions have, uh, I just wonder if you have a, something to say about that from your, yeah. from your knowledge base. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if it comes to like efficacy, um, yeah, it, it definitely, it helps. Um, but only so much. Uh, and especially anything that you're going to be able to buy or make yourself in this time is not going to be nearly as effective as it would be to actually stop, you know, and, and we can't buy a hazmat suit for, for everybody, but, but it's definitely the case that it, it's, it's a good first step. Definitely. I, I would definitely, like personally, if I'm taking public transportation, mm -hmm. uh, if I was to have to take a train to a different town, uh, I, I would wear a mask. Uh, if I had to be in any place where I knew I had to be, you know, not within two meters of probably a lot of people, you know, going to the, to the store on Saturday, it, it's a really good idea to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we have, uh, I've worn masks at work. Uh, various levels for the last 30 years. I work uh, making injectable drugs. So yeah. I've been <laughs> listening to this whole discussion on masks. And I have to say at the beginning, I was not usually a, a fan of the mask because the surgical mask is more for the other person as opposed to for you. Mm -hmm. um, yes. um, I mean, we wear them to protect the product from us as we're working with it, not to protect us from the product. Uh, but um, it does provide a certain amount of protection for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it does protect the other person if you're, if they, if you are the asymptomatic person. Mm -hmm. um, what I have found personally, now that I'm, I'm going out regularly and um, I wear it on the tram, I wear it in the store, mm -hmm. and I find now, as you mentioned, people, um, it's very confusing, and people, especially I've been reading some stuff in the Neuserger Zeitung and some other things about why the Swiss are anti-mask, or not anti-mask, but uh, whatever. Masks are fully available now. They were not at the beginning. Um, yeah. But what I find, and as a cancer patient, former cancer patient, um, I, I find that it's helpful if I'm wearing the mask, the other person does tend to, tend to stay farther away from me, which is what <laughs> I want them to do. Yeah. So yeah. um, it's a little bit, and I think the fabric mask has also that same effect um, for those who have sewing machines and, and want to do them. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. 
I have to see, I'm going to the hospital in two weeks for my annual mammogram uh, oh. MRI for my uh, cancer follow-up. And I'm really debating if I'm going to wear an N95 mask because oh. they give you a mask when you arrive at the hospital, though I will have one on anyway. Um, but it will be a surgical mask. And I'm just like, for the amount of time that I'm in the hospital, mm. um, you know, uh, but I will say the, it is, mm. I agree. It's a bit, I find it sad that the chief of the SBB is saying, we oh. really, really recommend that you wear a mask, but we can't force you to because the government hasn't said. And I'm like, well, every other government around us, Austria, Germany, Italy, oh. And I think also France is saying you wear a mask on the uh, on public transportation. So why yeah. we not? But um, yeah. at least we're not having people with AR-47s coming up to us and ripping our masks off or shooting us for wearing them. So I guess we can be happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. It, the 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 cultural aspect is very interesting in this as well where, um, I mean, that was one of the things, uh, visiting Japan, for example, that was interesting to me because people mm -hmm. normally wear masks during like flu season and stuff, just normally. Um, and then of course, in some of these places like Taiwan and Singapore, it's, this whole thing has been much less of an issue, uh, yeah. partially probably because of this uh, ingrown habit, but yeah, that's, that's definitely. Yeah, and you know, having worked my entire career with masks, it's, it's, I guess for me, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I know a lot of people are like, well, you can't see the person's face. And I'm like, I've spent a lot of time talking to people through windows in the clean room. And it's like, you know that it's Bob because of his eyebrows move that way. Um, so, you know, we can all get, get used to it. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about protective eyewear? Because there's a journalist in the States, actually he's an epidemiologist and a virologist, Dr. Fair, mm -hmm. who um, was reporting for, I think it was NBC, on how to avoid getting coronavirus, and he ended up getting it himself. And when asked how he thought he contracted it, he said he thought he got it on a crowded flight, and he wore a mask, he wore gloves, he cleaned his area with disinfectant, and he thinks he got it through his eyes. And well, so it's that's, quite, that's quite disconcerting. What, what's your take on, I don't know, protective eyewear when flying? Um, I mean, not a doctor, but, I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, for uh, Zach, from a, you know, sort of a scientific point of view. Yeah. I mean, first, I would just, first of all, I'd be like to not even go on flights right now, but mm -hmm. that's, that's like step one. Um, but if, if you absolutely had to, I mean, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, just the not touching your face is the hardest thing possible. But that is really the the kind of how this a lot of this goes down. Mm -hmm. It's it's very difficult. Um, I have no idea about using protective eyewear though. Right. Um, but definitely, people have have said that you know, like having because there's all these things that we touch a lot, like our phones, for example, big one, and we don't clean them off. I mean, our if you. It's really fun. It's a really fun lab thing that you want to do with your children is have uh, some some uh, agar and just like smash your phone on it and see what grows. Uh, it's always very disgusting. Um, but but the, these kinds of things, glasses, phones, you know, that, that are extraneous to us, but they're still a part of us. They're an extension of our body, basically. Uh, and that's something that can be very uh, problematic in this time. So. And just to think that the RO factor, the fact that that has dropped to below one is really interesting and encouraging. I'm just wondering, do you think that there's any indication that over time the virus is weakening in terms of um, how easily it's spread or its potency? Or is that not the case? Uh, no, so this, this seems to be uh, directly in, in response to the control measures that, that we've put in place. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be uh, any lessening in the transmissibility of the virus. Um, so uh, in general, uh, so, so, so we have this, um, there's this general um, theory about how a uh, virus evolved, uh, the, this kind of um, trade um, that they make between being transmissible and being very deadly. Uh, and a lot of times viruses, they, they don't really wanna be very deadly they just want to be able to spread as much as possible, produce as many virions as possible. So um, tend, generally when viruses um, evolve along this path, they tend to be less deadly and more transmissible actually over time. So there, there's already several coronaviruses within the human population that are, that are already actually far more successful 
than SARS-CoV-2, uh, just because they're very transmissible, but they just cause a small cold in us, so they're very not very deadly at all. So, so we'll 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 see um, along with everything else. But uh, but yeah, it seems to be that having the social distancing and lockdown uh, is really what's what's being able to bring down transmission. Are there people who haven't had a chance to uh, ask Zach a question that would like to do so? Yeah. Yeah. What I, we didn't hear that, or I didn't. Oh hear my! That. So my, my 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 girlfriend made made a made a comment actually about that. Um, with the lockdown, so so with with all these measures being reduced, um, there is always the possibility that you see a resurgence in cases as well. Um, yeah, that's that's certainly possible because it, it is very much a, a um, yeah indirect effect. So. But yeah, you know, um, I, I definitely have at least more more faith in, in Swiss people than I've had in, in in a lot of other places I've lived mm -hmm. in terms of uh, following uh, directions. But we'll see. Um, so yeah, so. Well, I want to make sure. Um, so the idea with these salons, these online discussions, is we wanted to share information that many of us are thinking about, questions that we're considering, and then have an action item at every, at every discussion. So um, maybe right now it would be a good time to introduce uh, one, of our, uh, our, one of our friends from Action Together Switzerland. We have Christy Worrell. Is it Worrell or Worrell? Worrell. <laughs> Worrell. Is fine. Worrell, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And um, Christy is going to talk with us a little bit about a really important initiative that they've started, a fundraising initiative. So I'll hand it over to you, Christy, to give us that information. Thanks very much. Thanks. It's, it's great to hear about the science. And it, it, uh, situations like this can make us feel a bit helpless, particularly when we see so much suffering going on in the U.S. So um, at Action Together Zurich, we have put together a fundraiser to help communities of color in the U.S. I know if you're following the, the press in the States, you realize that communities of color are being really hit quite um, disproportionately by the virus in terms of infection rates and also in terms of survival rates. Um, a lot of reasons for that. A lot of times people, uh, people of color are working in jobs that put them on the front lines and in direct contact with people. They are less uh, financially able to shelter in place, um, living in urban areas where there's crowding, um, also, lots of pre-existing conditions because of you know, nutrition and, and, and lack of access to quality health care. So there are a bunch of sort of societal you know, ills from the past that are coming to bear on this crisis and how it's affecting communities of color. So we've put together a fundraiser to um, raise funds for four organizations. Feeding America, which is sort of, it's, it's not specifically directed at people of color, it is a nationwide organization that is a food bank of food banks and they have uh, their network includes every county in america that's how kind of widespread their reach is um, and you have a lot of people who as you know have never visited a food bank in their life have never had to you know request aid with eating that are really in distress and so these food banks are really inundated with uh with people in need so that's our for first organization our second organization is um know your rights camp which is actually colin kaepernick's organization um and they are providing help to frontliners uh, providing ppe providing uh, shelter and uh and housing for people who don't have it um, uh, also providing meals, they are doing um, food banking as well. So they are really helping in black and brown communities. Our third organization is um, a Native American project that has a COVID uh, response. Native communities are being decimated by this, not just um, Native people in urban areas, but now it has hit reservations as well. So this is another uh, group that doesn't have access to quality health care. And our fourth organization, and that's the last one, is something called National Bailout, Black Mamas Bailout. And what they are doing is they are bailing out women and who are mothers and caregivers, bailing them out of pre-trial detention. So these, these people have not yet gone to trial. Um, they're being held because they can't raise the bail money. And the idea is to get these people out of prison 
before the spread of coronavirus hits them and bring them home to their families where they can be caregivers. So I hope you will consider um, giving. We, we have a page on Facebook. It's called Action Together Zurich, if you're not familiar with it. And also um, Democrats Abroad Switzerland has been kind enough to put um, a, a link on the, the web page there where you can go to donate. And I will actually put in the chat box here, if I can manage it, um, the link to the fundraiser. So I hope you'll consider giving. Thank you so much. And I think that that's something, you know, everyone can give um, what they can right now. And it's been exciting to see how the numbers have been going up and up. I mean, I know apparently when people first started, the idea was maybe to raise um, a thousand or two thousand. And now yeah, what, it was a thousand. Yeah. It was, and, it was a thousand originally. And today we just surpassed eight thousand. So, yeah, that's so fantastic. grateful for it's our, fantastic. You know, yeah. Yeah. Really grateful. Yeah. Good. And any, well, any, amount, any amount counts, you know, every exactly. little Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak and to thank learn you. so much from Zach. Thank you. Great. Um, so now we still have a little bit more time. If anyone, you know, don't be shy. If anyone has any questions for Zach, now is your chance to, uh, to share or, or just to share um, what you've been thinking. Oh, we do have, okay, that's okay. So Thank you, we've got that in the chat now. There's the information that you need for the fundraiser from Christy. And a message from David, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, if there's anything that people want to share around uh, what... They don't see your hand, you have to share. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, please. I'm, I'm probably the only uh, born Swiss here in this group. I didn't want to ask a question. I wanted to express my gratitude to the speaker that he cleared finally up for me the alphabet soup of SARS. <laughs> what it means, it helps me to understand uh, what an abbreviation means. And now, I, I, if I'm correct, it's severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome disease. And uh, I find that so enlightening and uh, I want to made me very happy to have finally understand also the difference between the disease and what the virus that causes the disease. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there's nothing uh, virologists love more than a complicated name, I'm pretty sure. That's, that's, I, I think that's their, their secret thing. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, there's all kinds of different criteria that they use to come up with those names. Um, this one was kind of a because at the time they thought it was very genetically similar to the original SARS virus, um, even though it's not as much to, now we know so many other viruses. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's uh, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Maybe about a question also. I'm being taught that the virus is not a living being. Uh, uh, it's very paradoxical for me because I, I think uh, Richard Dawkins defines life as the ability of a cell to make a copy or a gene to make a copy of itself. So a virus that copies itself, if it's not a living being, it's the origin of life. If we have this phenomenon, we know that life comes out of this phenomenon. Isn't that? Yes, yes. So th this is something that's uh, debate. There's always these fun ones. So when it comes to uh, microbiology and virology, um, they always like people always like to debate whether viruses are alive because uh, we use different criteria just for what constitutes life. Like you said, like Richard Dawkins has his uh, where you know everything was based on on the level of the gene and nothing else. Uh, but the self-sufficiency is, is really the, the key thing for, so for me, I, I don't consider viruses as living beings because they're obligate parasites. They have no way to make new copies of themselves without infecting something else. So mm -hmm. the fact that they're not free living, uh, that means that they can never be living. So, yeah, so that's... But they, they can't stay alive for 24 hours on the surface, so... <laughs> Yeah, they they have that little bit, but uh, but then then it's kind of a, a dead end. So so it's very much um, 
I mean, that's one thing that for me that makes uh, we all have a dead end in our lives. It's a dead end in the way it defines life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so so that's what's interesting to me for um, for studying viruses is because they're they're obligate parasites. So it's very much this uh, from like an evolutionary biology perspective, uh, from the point of view of a virus, it, it's you infect something or your your DNA, your genes will not get passed down. So there's a, there's a big impetus for mm -hmm. you to infect new new organisms. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the the ones that I, the ones the viruses that I study are are nice because they they don't infect humans. They only infect bacteria. Uh, so so there's something that's been looked at for doing uh, as, as doing what viruses do, but maybe in a more, more helpful way by hurting our other enemies uh, when it comes to, to microbial diseases and bacteria, so, yeah. That raises a question for me about what applications you, what applications you consider that within, but that might be an entirely new topic, but um, I, can you answer that quickly or? Um, yeah, so, I don't study uh, phage therapy specifically, but this is something that's uh, you know, very interesting to me. Uh, so there's this idea that you can use uh, viruses actually as a means of treating bacterial infections. Um, and it's just like a, a possible clinical treatment. It's something that's been mm -hmm. done a very long time ago. It's something that's still done uh, in Eastern Europe actually. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so it, it's one possibility as, as we look at bacteria being more and more resistant to antibiotics. Right. Uh, they're, they're not resistant uh, to many of these bacteriophages, these viruses that infect them. So there's the possibility that if, if we have the right cocktail or the right species of bacteriophage that we could um, use them uh, to treat at least certain uh, bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that was short, but. <laughs> that was, that was very concise. And you did an excellent job communicating science. I thought it was really funny tonight when you were talking about, you know, the challenges that scientists and researchers face. Sometimes it's true, we can tend to be more introverted or it's difficult to, to share this information. And mm -hmm. it's so essential. And as you said, it's, it's more important than ever to have, mm -hmm. to have that really effective communication. Um, Yes, go ahead. You were gonna say something, Zach? Or? Oh well, I mean, just just uh, from my from my personal life. So I have a uh, the head of my actual lab, like the research um, group that I'm a part of. Um, he actually has said that, that he specifically doesn't want to be in the in the spotlight when it comes to these things. And I'm like, you know, I'm I've kind of kind of push uh, people. It, it's become up now more, but there is no inherent advantage to a scientist to actually speak out and, and to be on TV or something or to actually thing you, you don't get, you know, a tenure track position because you did, you know, a certain number of interviews on CNN or something, you know, or, or actually reached out and tried right. to educate, you know, your local populace. Right. So. Right. But, yeah, that's such an important issue, you know, the, the whole, the realm of the public and how people see their responsibilities as researchers publicly. And as you say, there isn't a lot of, of support to do that. And uh, it was interesting that maybe some of us here went to the science march in Geneva a couple of years ago, you know, and, and there was so much discussion around, wow, things are really bad if scientists are, <laughs> are out in the streets marching, you know, <laughs> for demanding that, that science be, be taken seriously. And we are so fortunate in Switzerland that there is funding for science and that science is so well supported. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But before we, before we get, I, I think we're still doing really well for time, but I just want to announce that um, next Thursday, May 28th, there is the, at the same time, the next discussion in the series has to do with food networks, food production, people who work in the food industry. And this is something that Britta Kurtzi, our, our other um, co-chair here at Zurich is organizing and she's working with, um, she's invited Michelle Grant, who is from the World Food Program. And so she's going to talk about um, their research, their work in relation to food, because this is also an issue that we're seeing to be so important right now. Um, Christy mentioned, you know, the frontline workers, people who are working with food, um, 
and that's a story that is um, really, really touching to me or, or something that's a very important topic for me is um, farm workers, for example, in the United States. And um, yeah, that the people whose work is so essential to our everyday uh, survival. And so um, Michelle Grant's going to kind of put it, put the questions on a more global scale. And I think that will be a very interesting talk. And then on June 4th, the following Thursday, so two, two, two weeks from now, we have Liz Boz, who's going to do a training with us to talk about phone banking. And that's a really, that's going to be a very important way for us to get out the vote right now and to reach fellow US Americans who are living in Switzerland. And I know some people don't feel immediately comfortable with the idea of phone banking, but it is a very concrete action. And once you start doing it, you realize it's really, it's, it's quite fun actually. And right now people are quite receptive to the phone calls. We're not calling anyone who doesn't wanna be called or hasn't agreed to receive phone calls. We're not asking for money. Um, which can be something that is, can be uncomfortable, but as Christy has shown, something that is actually really wonderful and very important. So these are concrete actions that we can all do together. And on June 4th, we'll have this training with Liz. So those are, those are our next two upcoming events. And then just want to encourage everyone to reach out, to participate in our WhatsApp group, to join Action Together, um, Zurich as well. and. Um, yeah, to really think about how we're building and strengthening our community uh, during these really very, very sad and, and, and difficult times. And, um, and I want to thank Zachary again. That was such an excellent talk. And I look forward to receiving uh, your, your PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Darcy, I just had one question um, for I'm not sure if there's anyone on this call who's actually in the Zurich area because I'm more of a Basel area um, who isn't already in your WhatsApp group. But um, if if there is, it might help to to tell them what they should do in order to join. Oh, we can't hear you, by the way. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a very good idea. So if you want to join our WhatsApp group, what would be the easiest way? Usually I just, I'm in, I'm in person with people and they give me their number right now. Online, oh, what you can do is you can send me an individual chat. So you can go to your chat and just send me your number and I'll add your number to our WhatsApp group. Um, I could also send you the link. But is um, that a Zurich area group? Yeah, it's, a Zur it's, our, it's our Zurich Democrats Abroad, but it's, it's for the broader area as well. It's not just for people who are living in the city. Do you have, a, do you have an easier idea, Tori? Oh, I'm getting a message. Stacy is the one. There's an invite link too, yeah. Stacy, do you have the invite link you can send to the group? And then if anyone isn't a member already, Okay, thanks. I'm getting messages from people already. So I will add you. I will, if you send me, either send me a message privately on this chat or send me a message um, to, to my email and I'll send you the link as well. And Stacy's checking to see. Oh, there it is. Stacy is fabulous and she's already sent the invite link. So there it is in the chat. Thank you, Stacy. Great for that. And do you have, from Basel, is there anything you would like to share with us or any important news? It's nice to have, we almost have a, <laughs> we almost have a national event right now. Because Basel's well, we, here. <laughs> well, I think there are at least two of us from Basel who are here because Catherine's also in the Basel area. Um, and I'm, yeah, but what do we have going? I mean, it's been difficult responding to the restrictions. Um, so we, we've been trying to organize some more DA discussions, which were things we've been organizing, um, reading discussion groups that we've been organizing here in Basel. Um, there'll be one coming up um, in June that uh, Basel Chair Tori Mallett's going to be leading. Um, I think that she's also organizing a pub quiz. Uh, and all of that, uh, those events are all posted on the democratsabroad.org um, website. So in, if you go there and look at events in Switzerland, um, they're posted there and similar to this it's going to be a, a zoom pub quiz which I guess is a thing right now 
so, um, and a discussion of some, some readings about local politics and the importance of um, looking beyond sort of the national ticket um, races and down to more down ballot races, which is um, Tori's area of expertise. She's a political scientist. That's, that's really exciting and important. That'll be good. Yeah. And she, so she's going to be talking about that. That's one of the talks that Tori's going to. She'll be leading a discussion on okay. that. So there's oh, some um, suggested readings that are only suggestions. You don't actually have to read them all before the talk. Um, and then it's a, it's a discussion around that, those issues. So she'll be oh, um, leading that discussion. It, I think in mid June, I'd have to double check the exact date. Okay, but all the events are also on the Democrats Abroad page, so people yeah. can go there and see and, and join us. Yeah, exactly. Good. Any last questions or comments from anyone? Wow, this is such a, everyone arrived on time and we're doing so, <laughs> we've all been very Swissified, I think. I know I have. Oh, here's a message. Great. Yeah, I'm really pleased that we were all, that people were able to come together and we put this together fairly quickly. And it's wonderful to see that, um, that people were interested and that we had the support from Zach and, and, uh, and Christy. I was, I'm really glad that we're able to make this connection with um, Action Together Zurich and that we've also got different chapters here. So it's really a great, a great evening for me. Thank you very much for organizing and hosting. Uh, yeah. I have to go now, so I'd like to say goodbye to everyone and thank you to, to Zachary for the great talk. Uh, thank you for Chris, to Christy and Action Together Zurich for the great fundraiser. Um, thank you, Darcy and Stacy and everyone else who organized this. And Thanks have so a nice much. evening, everyone. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Darcy. Very much appreciate it. Everyone, Glad you could please, come. Please stay well. Stay Thank safe and well. You too. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Great. I'm going to stop the recording.